the early 90s, you know, the T8 lamps, the electronic ballasts, we got to become more electrical efficient. Um, and uh, we spent a, a lot of money uh, doing that. Uh, in that, from 73 to 2002, you can see that our, you know, our footprint has gotten a lot bigger. We went from about 40 million square feet to right now we're approaching 90 million square feet for the state operated campuses. This does not include the community colleges. They would add about another 30% to this number. These are just the state operated campuses. Uh, our utility spend now is about $240 million a year. We use about 1.3 billion kilowatt hours of electricity for the state operated campuses. So, you know, big numbers. Save a, save a half a mil, that's yeah, a million dollars here, a million dollars there, you know. Um, <clears throat> the conservation is based, like I said, at the campus. What the SUNY has done over the years is that we've de devolved control and financing to, to the campuses where the students are, where the decisions are made. Uh, we've given, you know, and what we've allowed is that we've set up a financial system where the money goes to the campuses. If they can save it, they keep it. Unlike a lot of state facilities where, you know, you, you spend it or you lose it. Uh, in the case of SUNY, especially with energy, you know, we, we, those savings uh, have been used on the campuses to, you know, further energy conservation, to add to programs, uh, help cut, you know, help reduce the pain of, of budget cuts, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, so, it, you know, the, that allows the campuses to uh, keep what they save. Uh, Facility staff uh, are the technical and the operational people, the facility, you know, the facilities operations folks on the campuses. They, they do the lion's share of the work. They maintain the systems. They set the, you know, control, maintain the controls, the HVAC systems, repair the lighting systems. Uh, and then we uh, work with our sustainability folks on the campuses to uh, use uh, our community outreach get the faculty and staff involved in the energy con conservation efforts on the campus. Uh, that tends to be a push-pull thing, uh, depending on the particular campuses. Uh, usually it's the students pushing and the, or the, yeah, the students pushing and the, and, uh, the faculty being pulled along uh, on the conservation efforts. Um, <clears throat> on this, uh, at our level, what I've done is I've worked with the state and private uh, companies and uh, state authorities to put together tools to assist the campuses in doing energy conservation and to reduce their uh, footprint. We've had private sector partnerships on energy performance contracts. We've done site leases and power purchase agreements with private sector companies to, uh, you know, on cogeneration. We have a 40 megawatt. Uh, plant that's owned by Calpine at the University of Stony Brook, which provides uh, heat and electricity for that campus down there. Uh, we've tried uh, uh, on uh, several occasions to do uh, renewable projects, and we're working uh, now to try to do some renewable projects on our campuses. <coughs> We use it, obviously we use a team approach. Uh, everything on a campus in the you know, higher education is done by committees. You gotta get everybody in, you gotta get everybody's buy-in to it to move forward. Uh, the state university is obviously, you know, has been uh, committed <clears throat> to energy conservation, reducing costs, reducing our environmental footprint, and it will continue to. We uh, are currently reviewing uh, the new SUNY plan, uh, and part of that plan will be increased uh, goals on uh, energy conservation, reduce uh, our energy use by 15% by the year 2025, and to reduce our, our absolute carbon footprint for the State University of New York. And we have probably 60% of our campuses 
presidents have signed the climate commitment and are committed to a carbon neutral uh, environment, whatever that means. Thank you. What I'd like to do is get our uh, panelists to, um, to come up front um, and have, uh, have a seat at the, um, right up front over here so we can get started with questions. Um, just a quick uh, comment here. We do have um, mics and we are recording the, um, the panel discussion and uh, you know, it'll be probably um, put up on the website at some point. So I would like you to uh, talk into the mic, otherwise we can't uh, hear you too clearly. Um, and if they're all set up back there with the video, we can uh, open it up to questions. And we can turn that on. It is, yep, it is on. Can you hear me? Any specific questions to get this going? Um, I have a lot of questions, of course. <laughs> um, and I can, I, can, I can get it started. Um, we, we were having this, um, you know, when, when we met earlier, the panelists, when I was going through the, the logistics of, of the process, one of the things that, um, that we were talking about is the mindset for people in terms of energy conservation. Energy conservation is not a, uh, you know, a very uh, exciting or not a very sexy topic, if you will. I mean, people are more talking about renewable energy and PV and wind, and those tend to be a little bit more sexier in terms of the topics. But the main gains, and as we talked about earlier too, the main gains you can get and improvements is really in conservation in terms of making your facilities and your, and, and your buildings a lot more efficient. But what tends to happen is, um, if I go ahead, for example, at, at my house, if I go ahead, and this is not me specifically, but in general, hypothetically, right? Uh, if, if I can change all my light bulbs, right, to go to compact fluorescent light bulbs, for, ex for example, I save a lot of money. Maybe I save um, 20, 30, 40 dollars uh, a month on my electric bill. But then what I end up doing is I take that savings and I go and buy a plasma TV. And plug that into the wall, right? And that's now starting to consume a lot of energy. So all of that energy conservation that I just got from my, from my lighting, I use it for something else. So I, I mean, that doesn't really happen. So can we, can anybody want to comment on that in terms of, is, there, is that a, a loop that we get into and we keep consuming more and more, primarily because of that? Uh, and is that a reason why there's no focus on anything you know, that, that, that allows us to do that? You know, at the State University of New York, at the at SUNY, uh, we have, you know, we've accomplished a lot. But on an absolute basis, we our electrical load increases by about one and a half percent a year. Uh, one and a half percent for us is a college of Geneseo being added to the system every year, uh, and it. And it is, and it's plug load. You know, it's technology, it's uh, computers, it's uh, all the electronic stuff that can fit in the back of mom and dad's minivan that's dropped off at our dormitories every September. Uh, you know, those those kind of things do affect us. Uh, they do increase our electric loads, uh, and we have to make concerted efforts to try to offset that. But, uh, you know, our load has been growing by about one and a half percent a year. Uh, to maybe address your question, I would say, uh, show me the money. That's the uh, response I've had when uh, dealing with different power providers around the country. When they've asked um, how much renewable or energy savings devices, what would you be willing as a rate payer, willing to pay into? and what would be that return on investment? And what was kind of interesting is that the it was demographically driven, a lot of it, where the demographics of the under 35 or so, under 40, were more, I want to do it because of the CO, the footprint, I want to look at the, uh, the energy savings, I'm willing to pay more for it. Where 
beyond that, people above 40 were kind of more of the mindset that they wanted to see what is the return on investment before I go make the, the actual um, investment in that new technology. So there seemed to be a little bit of a, a change, but more and more there was an environmental, willing to pay a premium for environmental and therefore more green energy or more green conceived products like LED lighting. Um, what we look at in a lot of the facilities that we've been uh, building is we've been doing a, uh, energy efficiency studies and as we've been able to discover a lot of energy losses, we usually turn it over to the client and say, we're willing to do the work for free, but we want a percentage of the savings. Once the client understands what the percentage of savings that might be out there, we tend to just get into a specific rate contract to go do the work. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. And once you identify them, I think clients will uh, be a little bit more aggressive wanting to capture them, as we've seen. Yeah, I'd say for everybody, uh, there's one thing that you can expect technology to do, but the other part is to, to walk the talk. Uh, we all control energy consumption in our own ways. Uh, every night when you leave your office, do you shut your computer off? Uh, when you go to bed at night, are you shutting all the lights off in the space? Uh, so there are a lot of things that you can do to control uh, electrical conservation. Uh, so get a ther setback thermostat to turn, your home, turn the temperature down at night while you're sleeping. Uh, I do that every night in my house, so I just want to encourage, you know, we know that, that you can't stop buying new devices, you're going to keep doing it, everybody does it, but there are certain things you can do within your control to reduce consumption, and it's that awareness that you can use at home, uh, take it to work too, and to try to do what you can elsewhere. There's uh, one other thing that you, uh, a lot of people who look at return on investment don't consider, and that's the uh, total scope of the uh, benefit that you'll receive. We talked about fenestration a little bit earlier, if you can eliminate uh, shades and shutters and, and curtains and so forth. If you're reducing your demand for energy and your consumption, uh, you're looking at smaller footprint for heating and air conditioning systems and duct work and so forth. So there's a lot of other benefits that you can realize as a result of uh, just implementing some of these changes that uh, we talked about earlier. Yes, uh, I want to add one thing to that. Uh, one other statistic I'd like to add to that, and that is the fact that uh, our VCRs and, and other uh, in, uh, electrical devices that have, for example, a little clock in it, like a microwave, do you know that that's about, in, in an average household, almost 30% of your bill? Because they don't go up, they're always on. People don't realize that. Maybe we should think about having those turn off at night. Who's using it? Yes, go ahead. You know, we use terms like uh, total systems approach and, and walk the walk, and, and I just heard you rail off a few things that we can do. But one of the things that has not been mentioned at all today, and it's the other 30% of the carbon dioxide emissions, and that's what's coming out of our tailpipes, and that's related to land use and transportation. And, and so one of the things that's interesting to me is just how neglected that is. And, and the realization, for example, that the city of Albany has lost almost 30% of its population and the number of vacant buildings in this city. And if you take Albany, Schenectady, and Troy and combine them, and you look since 1950, about 93,000 less people. That's the whole city of Albany's population right now that we have in vacant space while we're building out on green fields and we're, and we're commuting. And, we're, and, and so when we talk about our personal behaviors, nobody mentions anything about living in a city, the relationship between adjacent wall buildings and the heat savings and, and densities and the relationship between massive transit systems which will not work in a place like Clifton Park where you have cul-de-sacs and no sidewalks. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I would love to, one of the things that I do actually teach as an adjunct here at UAlbany, I teach geographic information systems, and I always said, you know, I'd love to get the addresses, I, although I know I won't, of the people who work in this facility and geocode them and see where they chose to buy a house. And, and so to me, that, that's the, the real big piece, is how do we bring back sustainable design and stop building sprawl and revitalize our cities? And so I'll, I won't leave that as a question, because the interesting thing is that's not a technology. We know how to do that. We have all these old examples, but we're just, it's a social project. Do you guys want to address that? No, I'll, 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 I'll make one comment, because I live in Clifton Park, so I have to be careful. <laughs>